Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to the series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three adventures for different systems. Uh, I'm going to be going through Raiders of the Forlorn God, which is for old school essentials. It's a level four to six adventure by Andrea, Tupac, Molika, and Veronica Wu. I'm going to be going through The Trials of Rial, which is Asylum number two by Jordy Williams. This is for DCC. And I'm going to be going through the Caverns of Shenog, which is an Agosa sandbox adventure. Um, and this is by Stephen Grodzicki. I think that's how you say his name. And this one's for um, Tales of Argosa, which is the Low Fantasy Gaming 2nd Edition, which just recently came out and I reviewed it recently. Um, all three of these are great adventures. This one is 23 pages. The Trials of Rial is 25 pages. And Raiders of the Forlorn God is 40 pages. I'm going to give a quick um, caveat to this one. Um, I received this one for free. Uh, Andrea uh, was really um, generous in reaching out to me and offered me this for a review and uh, said, you know, you don't have to review it, but I wanted to give it to you because I've reviewed some of the other ones on this channel before. So this one was a gift and I, I thank you very much for it. I think it's a great one. Um, and I, on that note, you know, people have sent me adventures before, and, and if I don't really like them very much, I don't review them on the channel. So I do, I just review the ones that I think are actually good. So um, I'm happy to take adventures from people <laughs> if you want to send them, and I'll take a look at them. Um, but if, if I feature them on the channel, it's because I think they're actually good. I don't, uh, you know, I, I don't review, I try not to do very negative reviews. I try not to review adventures that I don't like. I just think, you know, there, there are other people out there for that, and I don't have time to really go through and criticize other people's work in a negative way. That's not what I'm, that's not what this channel's for. I'm going to highlight the good. And so I think this is a great adventure and I wanted to, to highlight it. Um, the other two, this one is something that I kickstarted a while back. I, I kickstarted both Asylum issue number one and issue number two. So this is uh, something that I backed on Kickstarter. And then the Caverns of Shinog is free or pay what you want on um, DriveThruRPG. So you can get that right now. All right, let's go through Raiders of the Forlorn God. Now this is a great adventure. It is sort of a sandbox. It's 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 more of a dungeon crawl. Um, there's sort of a, an overworld adventure that's going on. It's, it really deals with a, a really cool magic item and creature. And this is an adventure that would have a major impact on your world, I think. Or it could have a major impact on your world. So if you're going to add it into an ongoing campaign, you want to make sure you understand what you're doing and what the consequences might be <laughs> if you... If you uh, because there's several ways that this could end, and uh, and they will have, I think, at least a couple of them would have major impacts on your world. Uh, this one also comes with, uh, so as it, it, you can see, it's got really cool color scheme, but it comes with a, a, a print-friendly version. It also comes with a soundtrack, and that's really cool. So you have a, a, a few tracks that play along and kind of give you a sense of the tone of the adventure. You have the introduction, and the whole thing is hyperlinked, which is great. Um, and you have a few locations, and then the, the Prison of the Forlorn God, which is the actual dungeon itself. Um, Raiders of the Forlorn God is a short adventure that should last two or three game sessions. The characters will escort the wizard Azarhorn in exploring the cenotaph of the Forlorn God, an underground sanctuary dedicated to a deity whose memory has faded in the seas of time. So essentially there's this mystical prison which has bound this god with something called the God Chains. And there are these, these artifacts, these chains that can bind anything. They can, they can bind anything in existence, including gods. And so the dude who's coming here, Azarhorn, has, he wants them. He doesn't care about the god itself, the thing that's already bound by it. He just wants the chains for his own purposes. Um, you find out later what those are. And the, P the, the PCs are just there as, you know, they're tools to get what he needs, which is to get the chains. So he doesn't care about the consequences. He doesn't care about freeing the thing. He doesn't care about the PCs' lives. He's just there to get them there and to take this stuff. And afterwards, he's actually very happy for them to die. He doesn't care as long as he gets the chains. So he's an interesting patron. The players might think he's more noble, or he's maybe you know, they don't know exactly why he's how just how utilitarian he is, or something like that. Now it's interesting. It's laid out in terms of scenes. There's the village scene. There's the sanctuary scene, which is optional. There's the hills, and then there's the dungeon itself. Um, it's an interesting way of doing it. It's very linear, right? You're you're going to be playing this adventure in like a sort of linear way. Um, if they choose to take this job from this guy. They're going to be going into it and it says you know in the reward section to quickly bring players into the heart of this action the adventure begins with the assumption they've already accepted the job and they're going to get paid 1200 gold pieces you can negotiate it out and there's rules for how that might work or you know suggestions there um so if this is going to be part of a campaign keep in mind that i think a lot of the tables if you say hey here's a guy who wants to do a job for you and he's willing to pay you this and they negotiate with him and he turns them down or it doesn't work out or it doesn't go as high as they want they might just say no Right, so 
the, the, this adventure is very interesting because it's, it's going to be pretty much like you're running it as an adventure. And a lot of tables do that, right? They play like episodic games where you go from one adventure to the next. And this is much, I think this would be better suited than uh, in an episodic campaign rather than putting this as sort of like in a, um, in a hex crawl or in a west marches or something like that where you can use this adventure alongside others. This is not really that kind of adventure. It's kind of assuming you're going to go through in the order that he lays it out for you, or that it's, sorry, excuse me, that the wizard is, is going to take you through, right? That it's going to be laid out for you, and then that's it. Okay, um, there's some pre-generated characters in the back if you want, and here's a description of Azerhorn. who's a sixth level magic user. Um, and then what happens if the dungeon, oh, over the course of time, <laughs> the dungeon resets, uh, with, with two exceptions, the Skullmaster and the Forlorn God. So you have a description of the village where you start and the uh, and the the, uh, the tap room where you start, um, the hanged man, and that's kind of an interesting uh, little um, I don't know element of the game. So for example, it says here in the central square, the dead body of a thief hangs from a gallows. The sheriff of Graven, uh, Graven executed him in the morning, and according to local custom, he'll leave the body hanging for a couple of days as a warning. Any chaotic spellcaster remembers that according to occult lore, a hanged man's little fingers can open a magically locked door. That's a really cool bit of like creepy, you know, like in-game folklore that actually has an effect. I love stuff like that where, you know, like burying a knife at a crossroads for three days and then unburying it allows it to kill an undead or something like that. You know, like those sorts of like folklore traditions of how to deal with certain kinds of monsters or, or challenges. I love that sort of thing. And this is right in the middle. Um, it's offered to you, I should say, right here at the beginning of this adventure. That's kind of cool. There's some rumors on how to pick them, what the trigger might be and what the rumor itself is and some stats there. Here's the optional encounter, which is the sanctuary, if you want to do it. They come here and they find out some stuff, deal with some imps and an obelisk, and uh, and then move on. It's just one page really quickly. Then there's the hills, which is just the traveling to get through there. You can encounter the hill horror and some other things, but mostly um, you're going to get right to the prison of the Forlorn God itself. And it's just a, it's just a, it, I shouldn't say it's just, it's a, it's a very good dungeon crawl with um, several entrances, uh, it's laid out pretty in an interesting way, you don't have the, the map right away, but you get the map fairly frequently as you go through along with a few pieces of art that are really helpful um, to keep you, to draw you into it. And I like the little bits, right, the luminous writing floating in the air and you can just hand this to your players, right? Um, or thieves with a class skill or spellcasters with using re language can translate it, but otherwise you can just show them this. And you can maybe do it like a, a cipher puzzle or something like that if you wanted. Um, it's laid out very clearly, the map on each page, piece of art sometimes, what's in the room, what's going on, and I think that's great. So it's a very well laid out dungeon. You don't get the whole map of the dungeon until later, but that's fine. I mean, you do have it in the extra files, you have a map of the dungeon. The Keeper of the Keys, what I would say is that the dungeon is, it's fairly open. You can go left or right, and each way will lead you to a certain kind of challenge and puzzle. You kind of have to go through the whole thing, as far as I can tell, at least on the first floor. Um, but there's a really good description of everything. It's, it's very clearly laid out. It's a fun dungeon too. I think that the sorts of challenges you're going to be facing is kind of a horrific fresco. For fresco fright. Many unsettling frescoes decorate this circular hallway. Uh, the trident. There's really cool stuff going on here. And essentially, there's this, yeah, this jailer, the skullmaster, who's interested in keeping this god down here. And you have to play a game, or you can play a game against the skullmaster and try to win. The treasury down here. The the Puzzle of the Three Banners. It's sort of more like a puzzle du dungeon. There are some things to fight. Obviously, there are fights as you go through, but there's a lot of tricks and traps and other stuff going on rather than just going from room to room fighting, which is really good. You can always add in more combat if you want. But this sort of stuff, uh, the, you know, the, the, the hooks or the tricks of a dungeon are more interesting to me. And I think this dungeon does a pretty good job of those tricks. The cell's mechanisms, which is really cool. You arrive at a circular bare room except for a strange mechanism in the center, and you can see it there, or at least an image sort of, a, of what it is, and how it works, and how to turn the levers on and off, and where they have to go in order to move through. You have the labyrinth, sorry, here's the jailer. The bone, the bone isn't the jailer, so. Um, the jailer and spirits that want to want to get out. But each ghost annoys the jailer differently if free. So you can free these ghosts, and they can make the jailer easier to beat, right? So the jailer can suffer a plus one to AC, or minus one to hit, or damage drops to D4. And make the jailer weak. Siberia, Josh, and Billy. <laughs> the names of the three ghosts. You have the god's prison. It's a terrifying vision of the god. Um, the god itself is really interesting. So you can unlock the god, free it, and maybe you can kill it or something. Um, if you take the god chains, they're a powerful magic item. Um, 
The God Chains are a powerful magic artifact. Any creature bound by the God Chains loses all of its powers and falls into a cataleptic state. The creature can be, uh, can't be damaged, and it does not suffer, nor uh, suffer, uh, not suffer. Yes, there's some, there's some editing maybe that could happen there. Yet it does not suffer, not suffer from hunger, um, thirst, lack of air, etc. Yet it still grows old if subject to aging. The party needs a combined strength of 20 to carry the God Chains. So that's just a, a bit that needs to be edited right there. But otherwise, it's, I haven't noticed anything like that throughout. Now here are the aftermath, right? The character set free the forlorn god and leave the area. What happens? And this is where it starts to really become, I think, important. If you just free the dude and he goes out to the hill horror where that, that encounter you can meet in the hills, if it's still alive, then he joins into it, right? And he be, it becomes his mount, sort of, or be, kind of comes back to him. And then he becomes this, it says, utmost threat in the campaign. So it becomes really, really disastrous. Um, the character slew the hill horror. So if the forlorn god is free and alive, it's, un, it's unhappy. <laughs> but uh, it's still he's still free. He should be a threat. If the characters slew it, then the regional leaders meet and profusely reward them. Um, that's kind of interesting. I'm not sure why they would know it or how they would know it, but they definitely could. If the, if the characters still have the god chains, then Azahorn wants them, right? And uh, and the forlorn god wants to destroy them if he's still alive. And if the Azahorn gets the god chains, then he wants to subdue Dagazin, the god of wild magic. Right? He wants to sort of use it for his power. And if the characters kill or arrest Azhorn, there's a bounty on him, they can collect that. So there's some various rewards that you can get at in the aftermath. But that first one, if you free the Forlorn God, if you don't kill it in, in the dungeon, and it gets out, and if you haven't killed the Hill Horror, then it's this massive threat that can enter your campaign. So especially if you were to use this as like a background adventure, and you, you assume that Azhorn succeeded, if the players say no, or if they give up, or they do something else instead, and you have the timeline still going, that suddenly this thing could happen, and Azahorn could have unleashed this, this problem. And then maybe they have to go and find him and get the god chains from him and then go back and bind the creature. Who knows what? But you could do something that way. Here's some new creatures with the Forlorn God and the Hill Horror. The Ink Demon, the Living Rapier, and the Jailer. The Mud Imp, Purple Badger, Snake Coin, and the Stone Mastiff. With the cartography here at the end. So here's Graven, or Graven the Town, and here's the Prison Level 1. As you can see, it's laid out in that very, like, you know, you start at 2, you can choose left or right or straight, and then you're going to go back and... You can double back and go to the other one. So there's not a lot of like looping going on. Um, and then down below, in a similar way, it's it's fairly straightforward. You're going from room to room. There are some choices, but they're kind of like long hallway or door. And there aren't a lot of hints given at like why you would, you know, sounds coming from the next hallway or, or things laid out very clearly. And um, So in terms of as a dungeon drawn, I would say I, I'm not a huge fan of the, the way the dungeon's drawn. I think it could be kind of more interesting in terms of going left or right or choices. But... The content of the rooms is excellent. And as a sort of labyrinthine ju dungeon, you know, prison, it makes sense. So I, I don't have many complaints about that, really. It's just a quibble. The open game license at the end, and then the back page. And you get what you have in the content of the whole adventure when you download it. You get the artwork and the cartography by Veronica Wu, which I agree that the artwork is, is fantastic. The, the map is drawn beautifully. I love the color. I love the way it's um, hashed and everything. New monsters, the dungeon, and the, the outdoor um, locations, and then the soundtrack, which I think is always cool. I, I, I like that that's becoming more and more of a thing. Um, I think Dolmenwood also is including a soundtrack um, in the Kickstarter. I backed it at the level where I got the, the LP, I think. <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to get the record, because I have a record player, which makes sense. Um, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Tales from the Oak, I think, is what that soundtrack is called. All right, so that was Raiders of the Forlorn God. I think it's a really good adventure. I think it's really solid. It is linear. It's the sort of thing you're going to run as more of an episode. Um, and it has these major kind of implications. But the magic item, the God Chains, it's a really cool idea. And the dungeon itself is fun. There's a lot of cool flavor out there. I think you could have a lot of fun with this adventure. So I recommend you guys check it out if you're in the mood for an OSE adventure that has that more linear approach to the, camp, to the, to the adventure. The dungeon itself is, you know, open enough. Um, it's not just room-to-room -room encounters or something like that. So, again, check it out. I think it's a great one. And I think it's only $3, $2.99, I think, on DTRPG. So, you should check it out. Okay, the next adventure is Asylum number 2, The Trials of Riao. Now, this is issue number 2. Um, we've already covered, I've already covered issue number 1. Issue number 1 kind of details the world a little bit, the special features of the world, the different races you have there. Um some of the backstory and the lore, and then this sort of introductory adventure, which is more of a funnel. Um, the players are townsfolk villagers, something bad happens to their village, and they have to flee into one of these spires. And they end up in these, essentially like magic academies that used to, you know, go under the earth 
and uh, they teleport from one to the other, and now they, they know some secrets about them, and they're, this, is, this is the second one that's detailed, so they, they are now able to enter the second spire. Or, um, yeah, spire. So here's the map of the dungeon, and, and, and as you guys can see, it is very linear. You're starting at one, you're going to two, you can choose to go to three, but then back to two. You go to four, then you go to five and six, then back to four, then seven, eight, you can choose nine or ten, then you go to 11, 12, 13, 14, you go to 15 or 16, it's very linear. You go from room to room encountering what's there. And that's totally fine. You know, it's not my preference for a dungeon. I've seen that in a lot of DCC adventures where it's kind of like room to room to room. And it feels very, like, I don't know. Like, I think that's how a lot of people run their dungeons where the DM creates a bunch of interesting rooms and encounters and you're going to, the players are expecting to, have, to kind of encounter them one after the other. And how are we going to deal with this room? Now, how are we going to deal with that room? Now, how are we going to deal with the next room? But there's not a lot of choice. Um, there's choice about how you approach the puzzles in the rooms, and especially two in particular, as we'll see, are open. They're sort of a brute force solution that's going to really be hard on the players, but they're open, in, and they're, you know, they're sort of encouraged to find their own way through. And that's sort of how this dungeon is approached. It's not like you're going to get a choice of go to left or right, um, okay, we're going to avoid this fight, and we're going to do that. It's more like, how are we going to deal with this problem? Okay, now how are we going to deal with the next problem? Okay, now how are we going to deal with the next problem? All the way through to the end. Some people don't like that very much. That's not my preference. But I think a lot of tables are going to not mind that at all. And a lot of tables like that. That's just the way that they play the game. And I think that's totally fine. So this is that kind of dungeon. It's a level one DCC dungeon. The last one was a funnel. This is a level one dungeon. And and i got to say a couple things. First of all, the art in this book is fantastic. Really, really flavorful. And the things that you're encountering in each room are interesting and engaging. So it's not boring. Every room is interesting. Every room is different. Now this issue also deals with some of the deities of this world and it also includes the abilities um, for clerics in DCC, right? So special spells, special disfavor tables you'll see um, because disapproval is a thing that clerics have to deal with in DCC. So each of the gods has that table as well and how they work, what their holy symbol is, what their lay on hands does and their weapon proficiencies and their turn on holy. Interesting gods and goddesses. I think it's kind of cool. Uh, and again, they're, they're world-specific, but you could easily take these and adapt them to your own world if you, if you like them. Uh, Riao's Magnificent Strike, which is a cool a cool spell that you get from this dungeon. And then the Trials of Riao was on Judge's Notes right away. Uh, boxed text is meant to be read aloud. That's one thing that I don't also like terribly too much is boxed, boxed text, and this dungeon has a lot of it. And then there are a lot of passages right afterwards where you're kind of expected to read. And kind of read a lot. The, it's not the most efficient in terms of its space. It's old school in that regard. But again, look at this art. The map, the cartography is beautiful. The art throughout is just really evocative and draws you right in. It's a great style. I like it a lot. You have the entrance. So this is what I mean by, you know, kind of a lot of reading. You have these very long box texts. You're supposed to read, I shouldn't say very long, but longish box texts. And then the description of what's there is just given in regular paragraph form. It's not bullet pointed, it's not bolded or italicized. So it's not, there aren't those additional aids to reading that you would see in a lot of adventures these days. So it's old school in that, in that regard. Again, some people prefer that. They like that older school, um, old school design. Um, I think um, some, one of my readers put it a particular way. I really liked it. They said it was um, vintage, vintage writing. <laughs> I think that's what I see, what we would call this. Yeah, it's vintage. It's the old school. Um, now there are creatures that are bolded, as you can see, magic carpet. The creature has its own stat block set aside, and that's pretty cool. But everything else is just laid out that way. Um, there's some italicized for the things you're supposed to be reading, and there's a handout, for example, you give your players. That's laid out here. But you're not really going to be running this super quickly, or I would say you're going to read through this whole thing, and then maybe you'll write your own little bullet points, or maybe you'll make notes. If it's a PDF, you might just edit the PDF and make notes along the side and the margins. That's sometimes what I do. Um, You'll do that sort of thing, but again, look at the art. So good, so good. This is the library, and the study rooms, of what the origami butterfly swarm does. The lecture hall, the melting door, second level hall, second level quarters with a cool uh, katar, and an image for a katar. I think that's how you say that, katar, katar. The gymnasium, that guy getting swole. That's pretty funny. Um, so, uh, you know, I said that there aren't really that many bullet points. There are some, as you can see here, with the Eternal Ice Mode and the Gymnasium, but it's not regular for every room. It's not sort of the, the way that the rooms are laid out. You do have it occasionally, um, but it really isn't... Yeah, I would prefer a different approach. And I, I, I prefer that much more terse, like here's the most important information, bullet points, parenthesis, 
italics bolding. Um, you know, I, I think we're going to see that the, the next adventure, The Caverns of Shinnok, um, really uses a lot of that to, to great effect. And I think it's a, it's, even though there's a lot of information and the pages are very busy, they're still fairly easy to parse because of those extra aids that have been given to reading. This one is pretty, pretty open. It's easy to read. There isn't a lot of dense information. The pages aren't designed to be really distracting. And so maybe you could, you could say that it doesn't need all that extra stuff. There's not that much in each room so that you don't get lost or something like that. Still, it would be nice, I think. Oh, look at that piece of art. See, so, I mean, this, this book is just, this is very cool. It's very, very cool, this, this PDF. The Electrified Curtain, the Battle Circle, the Victor's Hall, the Armory, the Room of Preparation, the Antechamber to the Final Trial. So essentially you're going through this um, wizard school, everyone died pretty much. This former wizard, it's not wizard school exactly, but like a, a room with a mass, uh, a spire, where there's this master who had his, his uh, um, students, right? His students. Um, and, uh, and he is still here, or sort of still here. Um, he has retreated into his own mind, and so he's resting in this place of repose. You get the communication room and the walking doors. And there's going to be a third Cylon, or at least a third Cylon, Cylon number three, with the galleries of Barsu. You have a handout here at the end, and in the back of the book. Wizards with laser rifles. <laughs> That's great. It reminds me of that Star Trek uh, episode, one of the first of the next generation, where uh, Riker says, those aren't muskets. Oh, it's so ridiculously dumb. <laughs> I love it. All right, uh, The Trials of Rial. It's a good adventure. I think it's really cool. I'm glad that I backed it, and I like that it came. I mean, the first one is really cool, too. The world that's being developed here is very interesting. I think it'd be fun to run in. I don't know if I would run this dungeon. It's not my style of kind of room after room of, like, encountering this, encountering that. I think I would play it with maybe certain groups of players, maybe newer players. Um... But my players tend to really like open world choice. They like having dungeons that are barely dungeons. Like they, they really like, they don't like that room to room dungeon crawling, at least the current campaign I'm playing. They don't like that room to room crawl feeling. Uh, they like a much more open approach. Um, and this isn't really open, I would say. You're expected to kind of encounter each room one at a time. And then the puzzles you're supposed to solve there are open or the, the challenges are, are, are open to different interpretations or different solutions. So Trials of Real. Good adventure, solid, uh, very solid. I, I would recommend you guys check it out if it seems interesting to you. Final one is the Caverns of Shinog. As I said, it's an Argosa sandbox adventure. And again, I actually um, the creator commented on the other video I did and said why it's called a sandbox adventure because originally there was sort of this plan for Ar an, Ar an Argosa sandbox campaign or like a setting, and it was going to have all these adventures seeded throughout it. And so these are individually kind of separated now adventures. In, and I don't know, it might still be in the works, but. Um, that's why it's called a sandbox adventure. So it's an adventure that fits in a sandbox. And it definitely makes sense. This feels much more like a location-based adventure where there's a hook to get you there, but nothing really time-sensitive. And it's certainly not linear in the terms of, like, you start at the town, go through the random encounters, and then you get there. It's much more like, hey, here's a location with stuff happening. Here are some rumors and some encounters around it and reasons why you might go there. And then just, you know, you encounter the dungeon. So it's more traditional in that way. Um, some rules about adaptation and, and once again if you guys saw my review of tales of argosa you'll know it's beautiful so the book has been laid out to be beautiful not the easiest to easily parse and see there's often distracting things on the pages but the layout has been done in such a way that i think it's really really it's intended to make it as easy for you as possible to read so italicized bolded um parentheses bullet points color is used here red green and blue in a really cool way um, sections are laid out differently. It's, it's a lot of attention has been paid to layout, and I think that's great. And again, the art is gorgeous in this book, just like in uh, Asylum. And, and Raiders of the Forlorn God had great art too, but this is just like kind of over, kind of over and above <laughs> in terms of art. You have some rumors, and I like that most of them are either true or half true. There's one false one that, again, I just don't like false rumors that have nothing to do. But um, it is interesting that it says the streams that feed the caverns pools have a young water dragon in them. So maybe the players, if they know that, will be careful about the water. And that's important to this adventure. There are different ways of getting into the dungeon. One of them involves wading through pools of water. And if you do that, you're likely to end up at the creatures, you know, fighting the creature, the big creature, quickly. And it's in that sense, the, the, even though it's a false rumor, 
it does, if the players know it, maybe give them a heads up that they might they should be careful around the water, and that's good. So those are the sorts of rumors that I like, right? If they're true, great. If they're half true, great. If they're false, they should still give some reason to the players to act on them, and it should still be something to do with um, with the adventure, right? It should still be, still be gameable. So even if the rumor is false, it should be a gameable rumor. And that's a false rumor that's gameable. I like that. There's some research. If the players do some research ahead of time, they can learn some stuff about this place and maybe be a bit more prepared. The forest trek with some random encounters. Some of them are more interesting than others, but they're all pretty good. And I think that, again, this is sort of like a... I might, I might run two or three of these. It, or if you're gonna, if you're gonna seed a uh, West Marches or a Hex Crawl, put this adventure here and then take these adventures and put them into the regional random encounter table. That'd be really cool. Here's the caverns that makes good use of the Dyson Logos map. It's a really good Dyson Logos map. I like this one a lot because it's very interconnected. Cave systems are kind of hard to make interesting, I think. Dyson does some good ones that I really like, and this is one that I think is really well done. You have a couple worked caverns, and it makes sense with the background of the dungeon. And also, in two places, uh, as you see on this version of the map, 15B and 17, so top left and the bottom left, are both open-ended. The, the, the note for them in this book says it's a dead end or it's impossible to go forward or whatever the DM desires. So the DM could have an entire new dungeon beneath this place if you wanted to expand it. Great for West Marches, right? So there's this level of the dungeon and then there's another unconnected level below it hidden by a secret door that not even the bad guy here knows about. And there's also the shades and the trap over on the right side, the 7A, B, and C. That's a different section. And then there's 17 and maybe that leads to an underground, underwater cave or something like that. So you have you do have a dungeon here and it's self-contained, but you have multiple places that it can expand to. So it's great for yeah, West Marches or for a, a more hex-based encounter where people are going to be coming back to a location multiple times. Because even though I think once you enter this place, you're kind of going through all of it in one adventure, at least this, this main dungeon. The other sides of it are going to be more, I think, more engaging. And there's also three different ways of getting in. 1A, 1B, and 1C. And each provide a different kind of avenue of approach. Um, here's what I mean by the format. I think it's great. So you have images that are designed to help, you know, you know what's, what's what. Flame relates to lighting. Music relates to sound. Paw relates to tracks. Hand relates to touch sensations. And spell relates to odors. And then you have bullet points. And then you have colors. For Red is for creatures and traps. Green is for directions. Blue is for treasure. Really, really simple, but helpful. If you can keep that in mind, and I think you'll learn it pretty quickly, then you'll be able to very quickly make use of some of these images and help with, as you guys can see, the, the font choice, the incidental art. There's a lot of information that's contained on these pages. If it were just paragraphs of text, it would be very hard, I think, to follow. So the fact that it's laid out with these extra attentions, these extra details, makes it much more appealing to run. Uh, and it's very visually appealing to me. It, ma it matters a lot. Visual, <laughs> the visual uh, nature of a, of a work is very important to me. You could have a great adventure and it's laid out very badly, and I'm, I'm less likely to pay attention to it, less likely to run it, less likely to want to. Whereas you could have a mediocre adventure and it can be laid out perfectly, and I'd be like, oh, this is awesome. <laughs> this is not a mediocre adventure. It's a very good adventure, but it's been laid out very well. Cavern events and random loot. And then you get the descriptions. Now, the, the map is repeated every two pages, but it's not in spread form, and in at least in my version of it, when I switch to the two-page two view in Adobe, um, I don't get two pages with the map. Usually what I get is two pages without a map, and then two pages with a map, and then two pages without a map. So it actually doesn't work out. An extra page, I think, would have to be inserted in order for it to, to line up with Adobe um, and the two-page view. So that's just a minor problem. I think in the print form, it maybe would be better. I don't know. I don't think maybe you can get it in print. I don't think you can. But regardless, um, that was the attempt. I think the attempt was to have a page, a map on every two page spread, and that's really good. Um, once again, you can see really, really well laid out here. Really well laid out. We have a kind of an interesting dungeon here. Uh, the description of the dungeon is essentially there's this um, tribe of weird creatures. They're the ones on the front cover. Um, they're, uh, they're the Nagora. They're sort of Cyclops creatures with two toes, and they're, they're tentacly, and they're weird. And they worship this creature, this this sort of like giant worm thing that lives in the water. It's like a lamprey, you know, parasite thing. It's, it's massive. And they worship it, 
and then there's a sorcerer who was a human but now he's not and he's trying to use this place and the power of this place to try to find a way to bring back his dead wives from the from yeah so he's like a necromancer kind of the fact that, that the crazy part of it is, is that he actually didn't have any wives he's just gone crazy that's an interesting background note that doesn't really come into it too too much but he's convinced that they exist you couldn't Maybe you could convince him that they weren't real or something like that, or that could be a whole other side quest of dealing with him that way. It's just his character backstory kind of develops him a bit more. He, had, he thinks he had all these wives and he didn't. So he's trying to bring them back. And it's the delusion. But the dungeon itself is very straightforward in one sense. You're going from region, just fighting, mostly Lindagora. Maybe there are some ways you could convince some of them, but they're carnivores, they capture humans, they worship this thing. It's evil, it's not really intelligent in uh, it's it's very much your you know old sword and sorcery going into a cave dealing with these weird kind of humanoid creatures that worship a false god and there's an evil sorcerer in there too you know that's kind of what you're dealing with here yeah here's the lash ray the 30 foot unholy abomination of giant lamprey and lashing tentacles spawn from the deepest underground lakes where the veil wears thin this is the thing that you have to kill and then yazrak yazrak is the is the wizard the sorcerer here too and he's uh he's another kind of sub boss that you'd have to fight both of them um some treasure as you go through there's an interesting relic if you go through the tombs the hammer of night it's cursed but it's very powerful and then there are egg chambers creatures that you're going to be running through gorlings spike snails and there's an interesting demon familiar encounter uh grizzig is his demon familiar and he can talk to you and that's some interesting ro role playing there as well and then Yazrak might be willing to negotiate too. If you roll on a reaction table, in fact, 5 through 7, he's reserved, and 8 through 9, he's civil. So it's only 2 through 4 that he's malevolent, so really most of the time, it seems to me, Yazrak is going to actually be communicative with you rather than violent. So that's really cool. Um, yeah, he's quite mad. He's corrupted. He worships the Lashray. Um, and he thinks that he can sacrifice things to it, and it'll bring back his wives. Um, but... He's not, uh, he's not just evil. He's willing to talk to you, which is quite interesting. Great piece of art for him. And you get the uh, side chambers, the, the three pillars, the submerged tunnel, and then the aftermath. What happens if Yezrak escapes? Becomes a little local villain. And here are some pre-made characters at the back and a cheat sheet for the system. So the Caverns of Shinog is a great one. I think it is a great, it's a great adventure with a lot of opportunities to expand it. It's a good location adventure with some cool monsters to fight. Sword and sorcery vibe. It would fit a certain kind of campaign really, really well. I, 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 and again, it's pay what you want, I think. Or it might even just be free, but I think it's pay what you want on Drive RPG. I'll put links below to where you can get all three. Caverns of Shinog, Asylum Number 2, The Trials of Ryao and Riao, and Raiders of the Forlorn God. I, I recommend all three of these guys. I think you'd, be, you'd have a lot of fun with any of them. Hope they've been interesting to you all. I'll let you all go and see you all in another video.